Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, with us today. Uh, this is part of our masterclass series on uh, uh, titled When Tomorrow Comes. And the whole idea of this is um, to be able to uh, understand, learn from, gain some knowledge of people from different facets of life, uh, people from different domains. And of course, I'm really excited today about the kind of um, uh, domain that people are coming in from. Uh, we obviously have uh, Shomik Sen with us. We have uh, Solom Kalra with us. And these um, two uh, people have been pioneers in their field, have been pioneers in the field, in the arts, in the creatives. Um, and of course, in the process, uh, what we believe as BMU is that we there's a lot to learn. What we have to remember here is that suddenly changes uh, upon us. Everyone's coping in very different ways. Everyone's, um, you know, um, realizing a lot of different things, a lot of uh, different um, uh, aspects of their lives. And of course, what will be important for us is to understand whether we should be able to cope much, much better. When I say cope much better, what I mean is that a lot of these things that are happening at the moment are things that we haven't necessarily seen in our lives. Whichever generations have existed here uh, are generations which may have not necessarily seen the Spanish flu epidemic, pandemic all across the world. Somebody the other day was telling us that uh, you know um, India lost almost 5% of their population uh, during this particular uh, flu uh, epidemic. And that's something that um, you know makes us feel, oh, I think there's something that we should possibly learn from. I'm rather excited today uh, with um, you know, the fact that Sonam as well as Somic are there with us. Uh, the series is titled When Tomorrow Comes and predominantly the series is titled When Tomorrow Comes is because when there is a sudden change, when there's a sudden realization, uh, of course, when tomorrow comes, how do we cope with it? And today, of course, it is important for us to understand from both Sonam and Somic about how in their particular fields they've been able to cope, right? So thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll wait uh, for one or two more, a few more attendees to come in. Uh, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction. But it is important that we, uh, I know that uh, some people have been messaging in and saying that uh, could we possibly join in the next two or three minutes. Maybe we'll allow that. Is that all right, uh, Sonam? Is it all right, Shomik? Absolutely. Could we possibly do that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, just give us about two, three minutes and we'll start again. Thank you. Thank you. So I wouldn't want to get this wrong. Um, you know, we I think they're telling us to begin now. Uh, I would like to introduce the two um, you know panelists there with us today. We first have Sonam, and of course. Uh, because I don't want to get it wrong, I would like to read this out. Uh, Sonam, as we all know, has a beautiful, powerful voice with an honesty and sensitivity that is rare. But even more important than that is the fact that she is a musician with a message. Uh, she has performed at the very prestigious Women in the World Summit organized by media legend Tina Brown, as well as for the global movement One Billion Rising. The World Sufi Peace Festival at the Pyramids, the Royal Opera House, Cairo, Muzaffar Ali's World Sufi Festival, Jahan Khusrau, the World Sufi Spirit Festival, uh, RIFF in Jodhpur, the International Fairs Festival for Peace in Pakistan, and at the Indo-African Summit for the Indian Prime Minister, President of India, and 52 heads of African states, to name a few. Thank you very much, Sonam, for coming along today. Thank you. Thank we you. then Thank have you Shomik. Thank you. Uh, Shomik has written the screenplay for films such as Anthony Korn Hair, Roo Baru, and Mira by Not Out, and Hum Tum Host. In 2014, he directed and wrote the screenplay and composed the songs of the crime film Gulab Gang and celebration of the 100th anniversary of Indian cinema. Shomik was one of the top figures selected by CNN and IBN to draw up the 100 greatest Indian films of all time. Thank you, Shomik, for coming along. 
And, and may I add, Shomik and I go back a long way uh, to school. In fact, uh, uh, Xavier is in Kolkata. So we've been uh, connected since um, we found our bearings in a way, if we can call class one as uh, you know finding bearings. So thank you, Shomik, for coming along. Uh, what I would like to do is maybe throw open uh, this question on um, what is your idea of change in the context of both personal life as well as an artist? Uh, Sonam, would you like to take this question up? What is my idea of change personally and as an artist? Um, honestly, I think change is really important. Um, it's important. It always has been personally for me. Um, I studied, I went to art school actually. I trained to be a graphic designer, even though I'd started learning music when I was very young. But I also was interested in art, so I trained. I, I had my bachelor in fine art. I joined advertising as an art director. I changed to being a writer because as an art director, I found I wasn't at the beginning of the ideation process. And so because I wanted to do that, I then became a writer. And during my time as a writer, I wanted to get back to music. So I got back to music. I have also acted in, uh, well, not act, I've acted in the theater very seriously under the chairperson of the National School of Drama. I was part of the repertory. And I have hosted television shows. So as far as I'm concerned, change has been constant in my life. Um, and it's all of it, all these learnings of theater, of music, of poetry, of art, of you know painting of being in front of the camera uh, all of this has brought me to be able to create the sufi gospel project which is what i created and soon after that a show on partition which was also multidisciplinary and all the music i make is really an amalgam of all the change that i allow and expose and force myself into i truly believe that as a person to evolve as an artist to evolve you have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone it will be incredibly uncomfortable you will go through periods of great lows, you will cry, you will feel absolutely worthless, but it, it is from that darkness that you will find light. And I often say this, as Rumi says, the wound is the place the light enters you and you have to allow yourself to feel that pain in order to rise and grow from it. So I've done right. it both, right. I mean, yeah. I'm gonna let nice. Shomik answer it so that I don't take up too much time. <laughs> <laughs> Shomik, anything that you would like to say on change or the idea of change? Yeah, so uh, for me, I mean, I think for anybody who's creative, uh, change is an integral part because I mean, for me personally, I need change because I get bored. You know, I guess, uh, so I was an economist to start off with and then I was done. And then I quit that and I became a writer. And then I said, okay, let me today. So it's always just been, you know, just doing what you want to do. And essentially yeah. in our life, we try and do things because we think, okay, that's going to give me joy. And essentially it is that pursuit of joy and the pursuit of happiness, right? Which essentially pushes you out of your comfort zone rather than saying, oh no, this is, I mean, that, that's at least my philosophy. I, you know, I, I, I like doing something, so I'll do it. I think I like do something, so I'll attempt to do it. I may not succeed, but I'll have a good time attempting. And uh, for me, you know, that's it. Uh, and I think, uh, and Sonam rightly, you know, uh, you know, underlined this pretty well. That until unless there is the challenge, uh, which could be something that you are faced, or you see a challenge and you want to go up against it. You know, there are two ways that you try and address change, and you cause change, uh, or you adapt to change. So you, uh, you know, either which way. Yeah. yeah. So you, uh, either which ways, I think. Uh, you know, you just do what you want to do. So within this context of, um, you know, the pandemic and the coronavirus crisis or whatever you want to call it, have you caused the change or have you adapted to the change? And have you adapted very well? Uh, Would you like me to answer your Shamik first? I'm, yes, please. I'm not sure uh, who you are. Please, so. Shamik, why don't you <laughs> since you started talking anyway? Okay. Uh, yeah, so honestly, I didn't, uh, I haven't seen any change because I was working on a web show, uh, a web series, which is probably the you know, large, biggest thing I've ever done. Uh, and I was, I was writing it, I'm still writing it. Uh, so that didn't matter. There is another show of mine, which is an Amazon show, which was supposed to go on floors in April, and that's obviously been pushed back. So that's an immediate impact, right? But both these things are essentially to do with uh, content, which is not theater revenue driven. 
so mm -hmm. they are in which way is the future and i think we saw it uh, you know much before right i have done india's first web show which is a show called badman for vook way before amazon and netflix came to india uh, with kulshan grover the comedy and really shooting bug budget you know. and we all we were all told that boss this is the future and at that point of time you know your so called big stars and all that would not come on the web because sir yaar when i still remember ranveer kapoor in one interview uh, with tvf had said ki agar ye film nahi chalta hai to main web pe aata hu you know it's almost like you know if that if the main big thing doesn't yeah. work then i'll come yeah. i think it's the reverse now right because uh, nobody i mean if you're going to go to a multiplex to at attend an eid or a christmas or a diwali release you never know when if the government is going to say you got to ensure social distancing in the multiplex right yeah so that kind of I mean, you know i was obviously also supposed to do a you know feature film which i was planning up with i don't know when that's going to happen so yeah so these kind of things obviously hit because uh, the avenues are there and the avenues have been opened before uh, something like this came about it's actually a little different from what happened during the second world war if you remember hollywood went down and these five directors there's a lovely documentary on netflix called the five came back and william wyler and forget the others um, anyway um, sorry and anyway, william wyler and four other directors essentially went into the world war filmed came back and they completely turned changed their outlook to the kind of cinema that people would like to look at frank capra and uh, you know some of them started doing films about humanity and some of them wanted to you know celebrate the american life and that's how a completely new wave of the storytelling began uh, but the theaters were there they were shut for a while but they came back here also i think theaters will come back but uh, people have found and there exists a safer uh, way so essentially for me also yeah no so essentially for me i think the lockdown hasn't really changed the way that i work because as a musician i create from home my reels happen at home all of the stuff that i write my rehearsals used to happen at home as well so perhaps that's the only thing that's different i'm not being able to rehearse with my musicians so i'm not creating with them i'm creating more in isolation which i also honestly i think it's a question of how you look at things as well and yes we'll come to the fact that about live performances just after this but i think for me i've just looked at it as if this is my time for me to create and open my head a little bit more and my heart a little bit more to see what i can do um and it's 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 nice to get this sort of space and pause to be able to create because as a live musician you are so caught up so often in performance after performance and shuffle and you know creating content quickly for like the next performance which is also very exciting i love to work with a deadline i think most artists work very well when they have when they're faced with a deadline because otherwise we tend to float a little bit which is also required you need that space to float and you need the deadlines to contain you but what is missing of course is the human interaction with other artists uh there was the question of there is the question of revenue for uh, live musicians so for my accompanying musicians as well who in one respect are daily wage earners right because they go from session to session or performance to performance it is worrying um however i do think i do think that we have to use this time and we will use this time because we are creative people because even as a nation we are the king of jugaad and as a world we as human beings we like to find solutions so we will find new avenues even for music i have been having discussions with people about live digital concerts i'm not sure yet how that's going to work because of technology when i say time lag of many people coming together with in different speeds of internet connections however i do believe that if you can pay to um, pay for an an online yoga class musicians should now stop performing online for free and they should also be monetizing their concerts because they need that respect even if sorry shomik you want to say something yeah, i want to add sonam i paid yeah. yesterday to be part of a zoom live concert yeah more power to you shomik that's fantastic yeah so there is you know one of my favorite musicians alive is a man called orko mukherjee is based out of calcutta and okay. uh, he does he's just started to do this fundraiser thing in which he sends out invites to 20 musicians at a time, to 20 okay. uh, members at a time on zoom so he sends out only 20 invites uh, at you know x amount of money 
uh, for per slot and then it performs so it's kind of almost interactive because you have the chat bar and people can send in requests yeah but and that's fantastic yeah yeah and, and that's I, I think, really sorry no go ahead huh. and, and what i think really comes across and i will not take names but uh, in this time if you're actually thoroughbred pure tonally perfect musician this is the time that you can actually tell yeah. the world who you are as opposed to a lot of people who we all know who are auto correcting <laughs> who are who are melody independent yeah exactly so that's the yeah. thing also i also feel like while i understand that many musicians you know so obviously there was that period the first 3 weeks everyone went into panic mode and they suddenly every musician from the biggest name in the industry across genres to the smallest name started performing live which was fine they were worried they were like how would we reach our audiences and people were kind of just figuring stuff out of paddling their way through and then they started feeling like gosh what if we lose relevance now musicians and any artists obviously it is understandable it's fear it's insecurity what's going to become of my identity so i understand all of that but i really do i i felt like i've been wanting to reach out to musicians to say this exactly that if you keep doing stuff for free or cheapening your art at some level you're making it so so easily available that people will stop when it is time for us to actually go into situations because this is here to stay for a while so we do have to move to as exactly as shomik said now the zoom concerts so then we need to also hold back a little bit it's good advice that people gave children in part relationships as well hold back don't give yeah. all of yourself away in the beginning so hold back a bit so that when people actually want you they will come they will pay in america there's the concept of passing the hat around it's the equivalent of that come attend a concert on time pay for it value the artist value the 25 30 years of riyas of 8 to 10 hours of riyas that, that artist has put into hone his craft and there are many people who are starting great initiatives also to support artists who are rural artists or you know folk singers who are carrying the baul tradition the rajasthani mangani art tradition so there are smaller ngos that have started like team work arts and and umanjuri chaturvedi has a foundation and a lot of people are doing this which is also great because they also need to be supported so yes i think there will be a way forward as shomik said and i'm very very happy to to hear that he, that he's just shared this with me i think that has to be the way forward and i think we all have to find avenues we all have to adapt and it who knows you know it may of course the, the excitement of a live concert will never go away so when it's safe people will want to go back to experience that because just sitting in a room the energy is something else and both the artist and the listener feed off it but this will also be a wonderful way for artists to collaborate for new music to be created so i'm hoping that in a perfect world when we come to it again both will coexist yeah but for now this has to be the way. so so shomik is this fear unfounded you know this this whole idea that um, you know because of the disconnect there might be um, some dilution of the brand equity or there might be some dilution of uh, the popularity of um, the artists is that is that is that actually um, true or can it be true in any case or is it just a figment of our imagination so it can be true for certain i'll give you an example uh, the kind of music that sonam does and the kind of music that orko does Uh, a lot of intrinsically powerful deeply deeply rooted uh, musicians who are musicians by craft and soul uh, will not find it difficult in my opinion because you will always pay money in the confines of your living room to listen to somebody with that kind of soul i think soul's going to come there what is going to definitely get affected in my opinion are dj's because are you going to dance right <laughs> so anybody who make produced music anybody who essentially adds things to a song i'm not going to pay to you know you know hear his production yeah i can do that on youtube yeah or yeah. download it on spotify or yeah yeah if i want if i if i want to do drugs on my own well dial 911 so is yeah. this a pg rating conversation yeah i don't know yeah <laughs> so anyway so uh, so yeah what i what i really think is that uh, in future uh, in the immediate future people will start appreciating soul when you're sitting alone in your room 
uh, no matter how small your environment is and you can't call friends over you will connect on a very deep personal space with that one artist right uh, i'll give you another example i'm purely speaking in terms of music right now uh, kovin kumon uh, this legendary folk slash urban poet uh, massive man who completely changed the dynamics of uh, bengali popular music in the 90s came out with audio tapes you know then cds put out his songs for free and then he went and performed in live concerts they were all sold out each and every time when he's 70 now they are still sold out because and he performs with one guitar one synthesizer he has no musical hands at all it's not just about the songs and he tries and sings various versions of them so every experience is a unique experience and also the kind of engagement he does with an audience so he speaks times controversially at times yeah. but it's a very, very unique experience so i think that uh, needs to come out because if you are as an artist you're going to come and sing 10 songs back to back uh, and no. do a medley it exactly like yeah. uh, the way it is already it already exists on on a record or a cd or a youtube uh, link i'm like okay great i'll come to you once and yeah. uh, i don't have to learn it but if i can yeah, create, if i can learn yeah if i can create that entity where a musician becomes more than just his or her music then i think i would like to know after a month what does sonam have to say about what happened in jamia for example if she has yeah. to say to me and then she begins the song you know i'd like to hear that because then she's constantly making herself relevant yeah no you're absolutely right right so um uh, how do you think the the music industry uh, sonam would um kind of look like post this crisis getting over so we really don't know whether it's going to be two months or four months or some people say normalcy in in the sense of um, uh, the physical distancing or whatever might take much longer uh, to actually happen so do you reckon the, the the music industry would transition into a different zone altogether or a different I mean, style not... different expectation when you when you're referring to the music industry would you just elaborate a little bit as to what exactly you mean when you say that because that's quite a large what about the music industry so what what i mean i guess it's um, one um, what what somik has obviously answered is you know what kind of music would people like to hear some levels of personalization some levels of um, deep uh, reflective uh, you know orientation the other is also this whole value chain within the music industry so right now i'm sure a lot of um, you are actually coming together to help each other out uh, which which is great but at the same time do you do you reckon a lot of transition will have happened in terms of how music is produced how collaborations happen how um, you know different kinds of genres might actually pick up from so your so particular think, context so i definitely think that the way music is produced is going to change a lot um, there will be a lot of remote production that will have to happen and i think that's a really good thing because um, a lot of artists like myself even have thought for really long oh i must learn how to use logic or xyz to you know so that i can start producing my music or at least laying down the vocals so i can then send them to a producer um so i think a lot of that really good stuff will happen we will learn to be technologically more savvy more independent which is a great thing because so many of us are also dependent on working with sound engineers or you know and so many deadlines so many times you have an idea and you want to go into studio you can't so a lot of that's going to be great it's going to be really good i think as shomik said a lot of people will fall by the wayside some because of quality some unfortunately because they won't be able to whether they can afford to get you know the production at home or whether they find that they have to feed their families so you know what will more musicians have to become teachers what will happen i don't know i don't know how long this is going to stay but i do think like if we try and look only at the positive and i think that we all try quite hard to look for the positive in most situations that's one of the things as he said about the pursuit of joy but you are you are definitely going to find it easier to collaborate with an artist sitting in canada for example or someone whose work you've admired you and it is really easy now to reach up reach out to people and i think also people are very because they are feeling so disconnected and music is and any form of art is really about reaching out and touching people but with your music so it's actually a physical touching but through your skill like when i sing 
for me it's about opening my heart out and when i finish a concert i will want a complete stranger to hug me or hug a complete stranger because i have opened myself up to you and at that point i'm not seeing you as a stranger right so i think that because people are feeling musicians are generally people with heart and soul a lot of them so i think people will be much more open to saying you know what i'll discuss the possibility of this so one of the good things that have that's happened with covid because it's been such a great equalizer i think it's also equalized this where people will be much more open to a complete stranger who says listen can i send you my music i know you're a musical great would you like to listen to it and you never know people with someone could turn around and someone like eddie weather could say yeah okay fine or you know sting could say i don't know i mean i wish leonard cohen was alive but that would have just been joy for most of us i think he would have been inundated with <laughs> requests but here also someone could drive to amrit ali khan sahab or you know say can we do so i think that i think that people will be open because it has changed the mindset and uh, something of this magnitude tends to shake people up and this has been a good shake you know it's also reminded us of our most important values and i think it will also remind a lot of people why they make music because a lot of musicians come into music for, with good intent and then tend to get lost along the way and i say lost it becomes about the money and one of the things i always say before we get on to stage even to my musicians it's part of a prayer i say and i always say before we get on to that stage please remind yourselves that the music is not here because of you you are here because of the music that is because i i want people to leave their egos behind when they get on to stage and you know that at that moment when you're creating music it's not happening it's happening from a greater power to you you are just a channel so i think that's brought everybody as a great reminder that you know yahi hai hamare paas aur iski qadar kare usko ibadat se kare isko sachai se kare and ab aage upar wala dekhega you know there's that that good thing has happened so i said for me i think it's been a good True. rebirth for everyone in fact uh, in fact uh, uh, if you have heard or seen any of the videos of playing for change it's titled like that the playing for change this is youtube mm -hmm. okay. channel which is yeah. essentially takes uh, which does uh, covers of uh, uh, a lot of songs like ripple mm -hmm. and all of that where they involve musicians from across the seven continents oh wow so a sitar player playing a riff on a grateful dead number Oh, have, yeah, there, there's a brilliant video about homeless people across the world singing "Stand by Me." Oh, I've seen that one. Yes. So that's playing for change. That's, yeah, right, right, like, okay, yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, so it has been in existence, and now is probably the right time to kind of you know fructify it. Yeah. You. True. So um, I guess uh, it's about change. The same thing with us in the education sector. Um, you know, even in the uh, the employability area. um reskilling um new configurations uh virtual teams global teams all this has become a a definite phenomenon that is here to stay so shomik um as far as the the entertainment industry is concerned of course there are ramifications on the business model um how do you see this changing how do you see the entertainment uh, business changing in the longer term uh, well in the short term it's pretty obvious right a lot of big films you find it difficult to release you can't afford to say release a 1983 or even a movie one uh, purely on the digital platform because you are relying on subscription revenue to justify your expenditure whether that's enough or not i don't know maybe it is maybe it is but you will have to now I mean, you can only plan for the future now in terms of production. But what do you do of, you know, wheels that have already been set in motion? What do you do for right. a film which requires you to do, uh, you know, set three hundred crores to break even, right? Which essentially implies that you need a hundred crore weekend. How is that going to happen? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen this year for sure. So what happens then? I don't know. I don't have an answer. so for these big films either do they wait it out do they hope that this kind of you know goes away fast and uh, you know meanwhile you know, so i don't know uh, however disney has announced the release of mulan on uh, july 27th i think uh, so that's a sign uh, mulan is a pretty massive film and disney more than you know making the film it's a live action film it's a live, live action 
uh, more than just the making of it it's about distributing it across multiplexes across cinemas and theaters across the world so for disney to have made a decision like that i don't know I mean, every day you know the president of america is reversing his decision uh, which is an unusual isn't he part of disney i'm sorry kidding he is he's one of the disney characters for sure right <laughs> yeah yeah most love for that yeah unintentionally so and yeah so yeah but correct so uh, you know so they probably are seeing it in a certain manner mind you I mean, we have our films but there are there are avenger films there's a second wonder woman which are all coming up and where are you going to show them they can't go direct to digital can they there will be enough content which goes direct to digital which will you know keep us entertained uh, for a while i think and pretty massive productions that way uh how do you you know what happens to these tent pole what we refer to as tent pole films i don't know it will completely be on a case by case basis it will depend on how comfortable people in various countries are to going back to theaters china i think reopened theaters a, you know a few days ago and then they shut them again because the second wave hit so yeah. until and unless the vaccine is found that fear is going to be there having said that i don't know what's going to happen once diwali hits you know because eid looks too early for people to rush to theaters and watch on cinema than it but i want to see if this curve kind of flattens and theaters open up and what happens in diwali because festivals are essentially art and culture that's the time around which everybody and if we see that the first film that releases goes out into theaters and there are no untoward incidences and the numbers you know meet because i think i think the numbers will meet my point is people are extremely hungry for the time that the theaters actually open up and when they do you know you'll again see a spike but uh, in the interim yeah it's a tough it's a tough uh, we just got to hold on what is toughest actually are the daily wage workers because a lot of shooting uh, has stopped it all shooting has stopped uh what happens to things which are meant to be which are meant to go on production even for web shows what happens to those so there was a suggestion that people will start working with lessened crew and maintain social distancing on set and stuff like that but does that imply that you rule out crowd scenes does that imply that you you know because on average a film set has roughly 70 to 80 people uh and that's just you just your crew behind the camera now if you have to cut down on that also uh, remember not just theater and not just web television is a huge huge thing there's a broadcasting federation which is right now playing recycled stuff and people sitting at home this is the time that they would be glued on your television sets or your mobile your uh, television spots would be skyrocketing uh, which they did during the gulf war which is when people were at home and trying to check out what was happening right now everybody's on your tv or on your phone uh, or on your screen whatever but i'm saying it's a golden opportunity for people to advertise but uh, for what you know so is there a consumption pattern that you're looking for the next 8 10 12 years sorry 8 10 12 months uh, where you have a possible you know launch of a product coming summer is going to hit this was supposed to be summer holiday it's usually the time that a soft drink major comes up with their campaign an ice cream major comes up with their campaign what's going to happen to those what's going to happen to those ads and uh, if they are going to push it if they are going to push those advertising slots how are you going to fill them so it's true, true. not as uh, rosy as we think it is right right so i've been um, you know we are actually live on facebook on the bml munjal university page and okay. um, you know would request uh, the people watching from there to you know send in a thumbs up for both the artists um, you know they they've been kind enough to share their uh, views and ideas with us today So, um, what happens to satellite television, Shomik? Um, will there be a huge uh, so change there? Uh, yeah, there has to. No, I mean, in terms of production, uh, you will have to work with skeletal crew as and when uh, you know the restrictions get lifted. Uh, but how much of that is possible? I don't know. One. Secondly, these are daily laborers. Remember, so I think one suggestion that was given was that everybody gets paid, but uh, you know 50% should report on set so everybody right. gets everybody gets taken care of uh, but you just 
decongest the shooting atmosphere. Uh, right. That's one way to get around because satellite television will need content. How long can we you know, keep showing reruns? So I think that will start first. So content which is uh, meant to go on TV and meant to go on web will have to start uh, because there the screens are waiting for your content, unlike multiplexes, unlike the theaters. Right. So uh, thank you. So um, thank you, thank you, Shomik. So I think we'll just um, change track a little, change gear. Um, Sonam, is there any um, fond memory that you have from your university or your college days that you would like to share with us? Um, you know, most of us listening to you today are essentially students Ooh. at different stages. Fond Any memories, fond memories? College. Well, I went to the College of Art, so I think most of my memories of, of college were very different from most colleges because we spent our days um, in the lawns drawing, painting, still lives. I mean, so it was fantastic. And we had a bunch of incredible teachers who would take us to uh, Nehru Park to, for a class in watercolors. We had some amazing teachers, so I had incredible teachers. I think what, I mean, it was a great victory for us in college. Now, when I look back, it doesn't feel like such a great victory, but it was quite a big deal because College of Art was not part of the Delhi. It was part of the Delhi University, but of course, because we are not on either of the North or South campuses, we were always treated like a bit of a stepchild. Um, there was this big inter-college fashion show that used to happen every year and we wouldn't even get invited and we were feeling quite sort of miffed and I think we decided we will we will participate and so we did everything from the choreography to designing the costumes to painting the costumes to creating a whole theme. We built the props and this college, I still remember when we, we went to Siriport Road and they announced our college. Everyone kind of think, thought that this must be DCAC, which is Delhi College of Arts and Commerce, but we were Delhi College of Art, Bhagwan Das Road, which we would happily reiterate to everyone. This college came on and we won hands down because we were the most impressive. Because you know, you put in a bunch of really creative people who want, eventually go on to become filmmakers and graphic designers. So you get them to create something and it was very magical. It was one of those scenes out of like a good Hindi film where this unknown entity comes on and I mean, that's how I see it when I look back also, unknown entity comes on. And despite all the crazy things that happened backstage, I think I remember I was supposed to wear a dress, the dress disappeared. So last minute I went on wearing somebody's coat and we stitched it in 15 minutes. So it was a lovely experience. And I think it also prepared you for camaraderie, learning to work as a team, um, realizing that you don't take no for an answer, especially under duress, you find a solution. So those are the wonderful things that I think college equips you for. What it really, really does though, and I, I have to tell your students who are listening is the friendships you make in college, the memories, those are going to be your loveliest, your finest, your most carefree times. And I think the relationships you have with your teachers in college, which you're older, those are wonderful and special. So enjoy every single moment and fraction of moments that you can at this time. Thank you. Uh, Shomik, um... Obviously, in your previous life, you were an economist. Anything about the college days that you remember very fondly? <laughs> college days? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, Mohan from Agni uh, is a dear, dear friend of mine. He's a musician. So, I have, uh, so we used to spend a lot of time just doing music. And college essentially is you learn anything other than the subject that you're supposed to learn. At least that's yeah. as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so it's really sincere yeah. students inside me, but not me. <laughs> So, yeah, so I've, I've done theater when I was in college and I've done you know, classical music and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I really liked it. Once. But anyway, so yeah, so what was your question again? Do I remember what? Special Any memory fond memories of your college days? Yeah, great uh, memories, but nothing to do with my subjects. So, uh, great memories <laughs> of uh, Why do no, I feel I, like I, this revolves around some sort of story about a girl that he's not telling us? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it isn't. It, there was an activity. Uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Of, uh, yeah, a bunch of uh, uh, all of us used to bunk school, a uh, bunk college, and yeah. I still I still remember one incident in which uh, four of my friends, right, were on the back bench, and between periods, it was a macroeconomic class and economic class. There was a professor who walked in, and I think four of us were playing tabla on the desk, and he entered and he said, "All three of you leave," and I think we weren't <laughs> sure. So all four of us. Left. So, so 
kind of. I think right teachers on. teachers forget that when they're actually asking people to get out of their class, everyone's going yay. So I think right. that's the punishment <laughs> you need to give them to say, you know what, the rest of the class leave, you stay. I'm only going to teach the four of you. That's what you need to do. Reward right. the right. others and let these guys be punished. <laughs> I think I've, I've I've taken you down the wrong path now. Um, you know, yeah, we, uh, yeah. the dean of us. What? Let's come Where? back. Bad advice to your students. Bad advice to your students. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. So what? Um, uh, so yeah. what advice would you leave behind um, to these students? So um, obviously, some of them are um, thinking about the uncertainty that exists around them. Um, you know, what's going to happen in the future? Um, so would you leave any particular advice for them? Uh, anything yeah, that you would like I, to uh, tell them? I, I'd like to just say that there's one thing that our oh, education right. does not teach us, okay? And mm -hmm. that is empathy. Okay? And that is, sorry, I... Empathy, empathy. Empathy. Yes. Yeah? It teaches you curriculum, it teaches you skill, it uh, reinforces the belief that you are the best, which is all bullshit. Uh, it does not teach you simply it does not teach you humility and it does not teach you empathy it does not teach you that it's perfectly all right uh, for you to not be very good it's perfectly all right but make sure that around you whoever is there you know just help them just help them that's it it doesn't matter how good or True. your worth True. should be determined not by how well you've done but by how well you've enabled others and no matter and if, if they are in, if, if students, especially at BN Munja, I presume all your students are privileged. Okay. So if you are privileged, uh, which I guess most of you are, just give. Guys, you know, look around you. We, we are probably, you know, the less than one percentile in this country. So just share, just give, okay, without asking a question. Right? And don't expect anything back. Okay. recommendation Harvard. You know, forget all that. Just give, period. That's it. Mm. So I completely so echo no, what, what Alex says. I mean, no, I completely echo what he says in terms of empathy. I was having this conversation just yesterday when someone said, I said the first thing we need to remember about being human is that we need to be humane. That is the first and most important quality you need to have. So you have to be humane to everything around you, to every living being around you, to the environment, to the earth, to animals. And yes, give back, as he said, if you're privileged, all the more so. I would possibly also give another word of advice to your students, is that I know that when you come to the end of your school uh, years, which are in class 12, there's this pressure to make a decision. You know, what are you going to do in college? When you come to college, there's this pressure of what are you going to do for the rest of your life? I'm saying even more, it's tougher now because all the kids who perhaps thought they had something to look forward to don't understand, you know, where are we going to get jobs right now? Are people even hiring? I'm just going to say, stop, take a deep breath. Don't worry because you don't have to make this decision now. Even if you make this, even if things were normal and you made a decision to say, become an economist like Shomik, you can change your mind. It is your life. It is one life to live and you must do whatever feels right. We spend too much time in the pursuit of perfection. It's not important to be perfect. It's important to be happy, more important to be authentic, and more important to be true to whatever you believe in. So therefore, if at any time you feel you want to make a change, do it. I did it. I went to art school. I became an art, an art director. I became a, a copywriter. I, I worked in the theater. All these things, none of these were a waste because everything that I learned, I was able to put back into what I now feel I'm finally home, back to music. But, you know, all these things, nothing went to waste. I feel that much more enriched because I had that experience. And I'm sure Shomi can tell you, whatever he has learned along the way, his being a musician has helped him make a film. His being an economist has helped him understand the economics of being a musician or making film. So, you know, make your changes, don't worry. Don't even worry if you have to take a gap year. This is the year then if you want to learn a skill, if you want to do that one thing that you really wanted to do, but you were not allowed to by your parents because there was too much pressure, you do it. And don't forget that it is your life. Don't forget you can lead it with your choices. You must go with your gut. And most of all, be, as Shamik has also said, and I would echo this, be in the pursuit of joy and your own truth. That's all I want to say to them. Great. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Great. No, I think thank you. I think that's very, very valuable, both Shomik and Sonam. What we'll do is we'll take up a few questions from the uh, the audience. And uh, there's one question that um, is for Somic, and it says, um, what are your feelings when a film does well? And of course, the opposite of that, how do you feel when a film does not? Uh, I don't know. Somebody's paused. He is paused for some reason. Paused him. Okay. That's fine. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, I honestly don't. So it's it's always good to know that if you've done something and a lot of people have liked it, what essentially, like in, in cinema especially, what is it? You know, what is the hate or what is the flaw? The hate is that more people have gone in to see the series. Now I'll give you a very snobbish reply to that. There have been times a lot of people who have liked a film of mine have come up to me and said, "Boss, I loved your film. And I'm like, why did you like my film? <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't think you should really bother about who likes what and the hit and flops don't make a difference. You should be true to what you are doing. In my opinion, the definition of success is do what you want to do. Some people may like it and most people won't. That does not and should not stop you from doing what you are good at doing. Okay, tomorrow if uh, you know my films don't work and if I am asked to do say a kind of film which I won't even go and watch, will I do it? No, I won't. I'll just try harder and you know make what I want, and hopefully there'll be enough people who'll say, "I ah, let's make this." That's it. Okay. Okay. Great. And maybe a, a similar question to you, Sona. Um, when a music album it does really well, and then a music album which don't necessarily do that well. Any thoughts? Honestly, um, when I started to make music, and I started to create music much later, because a I wanted to have something to say with my music. I didn't just want to sing for the sake of singing, and I don't know why that was. It's not like I was trying to be this greater holier than thou person. It was just like I wanted to have something substantial to say and my truth to tell. But um, I think for me, one of the things that I realized very quickly, and this was through my experience in theater, is that when I was talking about perfection as well, that I stopped looking for perfection and started looking for honesty because I realized that as long as there was truth in the moment, there would be beauty because it would be my truth. And therefore it would be beautiful because it was unique and it was honest. So I think that helped me also get over looking for validation from the outside world. And I started to look for the validation between myself. Have I told the truth to the best of my ability? Am I happy with what I've done? Of course, it's very nice if someone also says really great or not. But so, you know, for me, again, I, I'd say what Tromic says, when you have a great performance, you feel great because you know you've performed well. And you've done things in that performance, either vocally that you didn't think were possible or you surpassed yourself. Or the energy in the room was great. Fine, we'll also, but there are times when it's a bad performance. I actually come back, and I perhaps it's either a question of perspective. I actually come back and say it's good if the performance didn't feel as fantastic because it's a reminder to myself that I have to work that much harder. It's also a leveler, as far as I'm concerned, from God. And here I am. I believe in a greater power. It's a leveler to remind me again of the humility and to remind me that I am not here. The music is not here because of me, I am here because of the music. So for me, this is just an ongoing cycle. And as Shomik says, if everybody likes what you do, then you're doing something wrong. I'm convinced of that as well. You know, I don't want the lowest common denominator to be what I create. I don't want oh, the lowest. Well, we do define you well, that. Yeah. yeah, it's okay to have this up and down. Yeah. And if there's someone on Twitter who writes a terrible thing about me or something, I feel fine. I'll even, in fact, people say don't engage. I engage in the most polite manner saying, you know, thank you so much for your feedback. And 90% of the time, the person just gets so embarrassed because they were doing it out of nastiness. But I say, I'm going to take what you said and think about it. Because it's okay. It's okay. I mean, if I really, if I had achieved or if everything's going to be great, then it's so boring as well. I mean, you have to keep challenging yourself. You have to keep trying to be better. So you've got to sure, take life sure. like that. Okay, okay. So I think there's one question. I think Smitha Jaina had a very similar question. How do you take negative remarks? So we kind of covered that. Uh, Tushar has a question on the uh, the industry per se. The live production crew has been hit really hard, and I don't think digital concerts are going to be that successful because it doesn't share the same energy and the vibe. How do you think people are going to react once this lockdown is lifted? Um, uh, shall I answer that? Oh, 
Both of us can. I mean, I just, I actually think, I think that once the lockdown is lifted, people will want to go out. I think the way we present concerts will perhaps have to be a little different. I mean, I was ideating the other day and had this exciting, creative visual of this large hall with like listening booths and prospects and everything. But of course, that's going to be really cool and 3D. And who knows, somebody might do that. But I think one of the modalities, more practical ways of making it work would be like open air concerts when, for example, the weather gets better in, say, a place like Delhi. You can have open air concerts, everyone brings their own drug, you have social distancing, you're far away enough from the artists. I think they will come back for that because, yes, there is a great desire for live music. But as, as Shomik also said, if that can't happen, people will, mindsets will have to change, right? We, we will have to adapt. People are still seeing this as short term. Um, therefore, they're not willing to make that mind shift. But if this is going to be long term and no one really knows what's going to happen, if this is going to be long term, then people who really want music will listen online. But um, we are obviously hoping for the sake of all the backline crew, for the sake of the fact that it is exciting, that nothing can replace human to human, actual human to human interaction, sitting with each other. We're all hoping for the sake of that, of course, that this gets over quickly. But I think the first way we can try and go back is to have large open air garden spaces where we have these concerts. At least this, that was one of my ideas. Shomik, what do you think? What was the Shomik. name of the, of, the, of the guy who asked the question? Tushar. Tushar. Tushar, Tushar uh, my first, quest, my first uh, question to you is, as you said, you know, it doesn't share the same vibe. Yeah, it doesn't. The vibe of you know 1,000 people jiving on say a Paul Jam concert, it obviously does. So what are you going to do? If you're not allowed to get out of your house. What are you going to do? Either you say, "Boss, I'm not going to listen to you. I would much rather spend my time on Netflix." Till how long? Huh. Secondly, uh, the way great art comes to you is not that you know. Okay, I have to go to a concert. I go there. No, a band like Paul Jam or say anybody. For the matter of performer like Arjit Singh, he has come to you first, not through a live concert. He's come to you first through a soundtrack. You heard something. And then he said, Okay, I want to go to that guy. The man I was referring to, Orko Mukherjee, who I paid money to attend one of his web concerts yesterday, I've never heard him live. I've only heard him on Instagram. And I don't think he cares. He performs with his ukulele in his house with a fan teacher. And there's a painting and he performs. But if you are a true blue connoisseur of music, not only will you listen to what that guy sings, you will tell people, have you heard him? And he said, no, where is he? Oh, he said, have you heard Sonam Singh? Well, no, I have where she's on Instagram. So you go to Instagram, you hear that 45 second clip or that you know Instagram TV started in uh, minute one cover, and then you go and check her out, and you're like, yeah, not bad. Eh? And then, then you hear that she's coming up with a web concert the week after. You have two options. Okay. Either you pay and you go, or you say, hey, TK, I'm happy with what she's done or whatever. It'll take time for the yeah. for this in to, you know, it's very early days and it's you know hit True. the joke True. kind of vibe. So True. it'll it take its time, but it'll get there. I'll give you an even better example. Okay. Uh, during the uh, this world web concert with Shahrukh and everybody were there. You saw on a split screen the Rolling Stones performing. Right? Keith Richards, uh, you know, playing alongside. Yeah. Yeah. The air drumming. Yeah. How will you ever replicate that experience in a live concert with the legends? Okay, who don't move up? Who stopped touring? You never know. Keith Richards might tomorrow say, okay, I'm going to like perform. Andy Meola performs on Facebook. Okay. Zakir Hussain has come on Instagram. He does Instagram lives. Yeah. And I, I don't want to go to a place where I want the vibe of 1,000 people. I don't care. Zakir Hussain, he from his living room, is playing thekas in front of me. I will attend that. So I'm just saying that a lot of, yeah, I mean, as, as I mentioned previously, the entire parting vibe will probably take a huge hit for a while. And then yeah. when the lockdown, the All right. things will be back to the score. Thank you. So I think we've got about five minutes to for the rest of the questions. So 
Uh, I'll keep this one short. It's a longer one. Kiran asks, how do you balance the pursuit of joy with the pursuit of making a living? The pursuit of joy as opposed to making a living. Uh, Sonam? I think, I mean, for me, it's been fairly simple. I, I just always believe that you are going to, um, if, you, if you do what you do because you want to do it, the chances of you doing well at it are greater. So, I mean, um, I honestly have never felt the struggle with that because I've always done what I've loved. And, and I think that I've worked really hard at it. So I will say the pursuit of joy um, married with, the, with an obsessive discipline or an obsessive um, not thinking about the hours that you work, working really, really hard. There is no way then you're not going to be able to make a living. I mean, I, I think that it would be really difficult for you to not make a living if you're putting in crazy hours. Because hard work essentially has to pay. At least that's what I've experienced in my life. I don't know many people who work really hard and don't sort of see the results. Um, so you just have to man manage the hard work. Nothing comes easily. It will be a huge struggle. But I mean, the struggle makes it all, all the more worth what you eventually get in the end. It's going to be hard, but the pursuit of joy is also hard. Yeah, I would just like Shall to we... add, yeah, uh, that uh, I think the hard work uh, does not seem hard if you are pursuing joy, because then it's not hard yeah. work at all. I don't think I work hard at all. But uh, hmm, yeah. you know, right? Uh, that's true. Yeah, that's why it doesn't feel difficult. I find it yeah. much harder to plan a vacation. Right, because that's like tougher. <laughs> right, yeah. well, not tough. That's one. Secondly, uh, speaking purely monetarily, I happen, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in an industry where uh, it's decently well paid. And uh, so I think, uh, but at the same time, there are also enough number of people who really work hard and who really want to, you know, be what they want to be and who don't make that kind of money. Obviously, these are you know enough case studies, and uh, right. well, you know, that happens. What else can I say? I mean, your joy only probably gives you that additional impetus to keep being at it. Uh, obviously, a lot of people make that uh, transition that you know I want to be a singer. That's what gives me joy, but I'm not good enough. Okay, uh, I tried being a cricket cricketer for a very brief while. I figured out I'm not good enough. So then, either you leave. And you know, make that one compromise, or you say, no, I'm gonna, you know, try and make it harder. And uh, some people make it. Harder. Or you work in the supporting space of that area that you love. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So Gurbiji asks, uh, do you think tomorrow, Sonam, to you, do you think tomorrow will take us back to the future when Sufi greats roam the world in ecstasy? Are you thinking of like Rumi coming back? I'm just wondering, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> you know, I also feel like, well, that's for another conversation, the word Sufi and how it's used so loosely. We won't get into that right now. But I think it'll take us to definitely, I have this, and maybe here I'm the eternal optimist, but I do believe that this time will be one of rebirth, one of us realizing that we can live with a lot less, um, one of us, one of us needing a time where we need to realize that compassion is the need of the hour. The world for the first time that I think that in the history of many, many years, the world comes together. There are all these amazing face group, group groups, for example. Someone sent me an invite yesterday to just post a view from my window. The world is coming together and people are feeling the need to connect. So the human connection will come back. So yes, it may make everyone more Sufi in their way of thinking, but Sufism is an acceptance of all humanity as equal. And if that happens, more power to this coronavirus for making it happen. I can only say <laughs> that judging by what you said, if we can all learn to be less communal as a result of this coronavirus, and that makes us more Sufi, and we understand that it is an equalizer that didn't choose religion, it didn't choose gender, it didn't choose well, it made it decided that it would infect whoever it wanted to. If we can keep that as a constant reminder, then maybe we would all become a little bit more Sufi in our way. I would request uh, a lot more people on Facebook to post in their questions over there. Uh, we'll try and answer as many, but uh, I think it's short on time. So we'll take one or two questions and maybe one or two um, very, very short answers. Um, 
one question asks how do you see the education institutions and entertainment industry coming together so do you see them coming together show me a little bit more yeah. um, education I, and entertainment yeah absolutely i think uh, when you say coming together uh, i presume you essentially imply storytelling uh, as a means of delivering information i'll give you a small okay uh, and when I was in Delhi School of Economics, uh, I remember Professor Badal Mukherjee, while teaching game theory, had used films as reference. One was a Danny K film, I don't remember the name, and the other was Dulhe Raja, the Govinda Kader Khan film, to explain the prisoner's oh. dialogue. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one kind of coming together. The other is of uh, imparting knowledge about the education industry in institutes like yourself and i don't think there is enough being done uh, i don't think people you know come out of a management institute having any clue as to how the entertainment industry runs uh, that i think is intrinsic because and important because of the sheer size of that industry and where it is going uh, everything from content creation to bandwidth management, uh, all of this is part of the entertainment industry of the future. Uh, how to measure access, last point to reach, business models, uh, all of it. I don't think any management school teaches any of this because it's a very nascent technology, but it's here to stay. So the way you consume entertainment is going to be through your phone, at least for the immediate future. And uh, I don't see any uh, business school teaching or having modules as to how, what is the, you know, how shall I say, the scalability of a multiplex, or what does it cost to set up an OTT platform, you know, and the business model behind. It. So I think it's very, very essential that all of these becomes part of curriculum. Okay, great, thank you. So I think um, we kind of done with the time. Um, it's about three minutes past seven, so. There have been specific requests. I, I hope you can keep um, uh, this request. Um, you know, this request is more around um, maybe singing a few lines. I know Shomik, you're also, uh, you know, a singer. Um, and Sh Shomik is a singer. Sh Sonom is a singer. Just Shomik a few lines. Sing. Just a few lines. <laughs> I, I request the both of you, um, you know, um, to sing just a few yeah. lines before we sign off. Yeah, we can't sing together because obviously it's a lag uh, issue. But Sonom can sing my song. <laughs> no, no, you know, honestly, for me, and most people find this really hard to believe, it is truly Ibadat for me. So it's very hard for me to get on and do these few lines. I find it um, hard, I would say, if you would like to tune in at some point. I haven't really gone Facebook Live yet, but right. if I do, I will feel brave <laughs> enough to uh, sing Shomik's very beautiful song. I was telling him one of my favorite songs from Gulab Gang is Jai Ho. Absolutely stunning lyric sung in his very beautiful voice. So I would not even try because honestly, I think it is perfection. So I will not sing that. But um, pe maybe something mujhe, from Mujhe sahi lagta nahi to ab kabhi YouTube pe jaiye gaane suniye ya mujhe sahi nahi lagta. Shomik, aap suna do kuch. Um, yeah, I'll get it. Right, must okay. be literally Shomik. one of the only artists who doesn't do this. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shomik, you'll have to say us. <laughs> yeah, since Sonam said no. <laughs> this might encourage you as well, Sonam. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Jai Ho, 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 J
तेरी जय red roses too i see them bloom for me and for you and i think to myself what a wonderful world the colors of a rainbow so pretty in the sky they are also on the faces the people going by i see friends shaking hands saying how do you do they really saying i love you i hear baby cry and i watch them grow they learn much more than i will ever know and i think to myself what a wonderful world yes i think to myself what a wonderful world so it's been in my head it's nothing it's not my classical stuff it's not sufi but it's been in my head so relevant so well, thank you relevant reminder of okay. all the things that are important these days thank you and i think uh, it's an absolute pleasure listening to you and i'm sure the audience uh, the participants um, the all the attendees really picked up a lot of nuggets of very insightful information very reflective uh, very deep thank you so much for being with us um, it's an absolute um, you know pleasure to have you over we wanted to try something uh, different we tr- want to try something um, uh, refreshing and i think uh, this has been exactly that very refreshing very reflective and something that will stay in my mind and of course the participant mind for a while thank you thank you very thank much thank you so um, much for uh, all the wonderful questions you asked and for this conversation and thank you as a result of this conversation i got a chance to speak to someone as lovely as shomek as well um i think again at this time for all of us to connect and the more we talk about these things the more we will assimilate and the more we will ideate and the more we create so thank you for opening my mind absolutely well. so thank you absolutely thank you shomik thank you shomik thank you sonam uh, uh, like stay safe this, uh, thank you to your uh, students and just yes. tell everybody that you know this passes everything passes and this too shall pass this is something that you got to talk to your grandkids about <laughs> yes bar <laughs> very unique times and i know very great for learning we are all we've all rebooted okay professors students Absolutely. professionals we all have rebooted so we are all in the same boat so nothing to worry nothing to you know whatever about and we'll we we'll yeah. see see yourself on the other side Absolutely. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank Take you. care now. Thank Bye, everyone. So Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.